Aeneid, Book One. Arms I sing, and a man, the first to come from the shores of Troy, exiled by fate to Italy and the Lavinian coast, a man battered on land and sea by the powers above in the face of Juno's relentless wrath, a man who also suffered greatly in war until he could found his city and bring his gods into Latium, from which arose the Latin people, our Alban forefathers, and the high walls of everlasting Rome. Muse, tell me why the Queen of Heaven was so aggrieved, her godhead so offended, that she forced a man of faultless devotion to endure so much hardship. Can there be anger so great in the hearts of gods on high? There was an ancient city, Carthage, colonized by Tyrians, facing Italy in the Tiber's mouth far across the sea, a city rich in resources, fierce in war, and favored by Juno more than any other place on earth, even more than Samos. Here were her arms, her chariot. This was the city the goddess cherished and strove to make capital of the world, if the fates permitted. But she had heard that a scion of Trojan blood would someday level Carthage's citadel, that a Trojan people, an imperial power, would destroy Libya. So the Parse were spinning out fate. The goddess brooded on this and on the Trojan War, which she herself, Saturnian Juno, had waged on behalf of her beloved Greeks, ever mindful of the judgment of Paris, the cause of the war, and her savage grief over her beauty scorned by that hateful race. Nor could she forget the spiteful honor given to ravaged Ganymede. Incensed with these memories, the goddess kept the Trojan remnant that had escaped the Greeks and Achilles' rage tossed all over the sea's expanse, far from Latium, doomed to wander the circling waters year after year. So massive was the labor of founding Rome. Sicily had scarcely dropped out of sight, and they were sailing joyfully on the open sea, bronze prows shearing the sea spume, when Juno, nursing her heart's eternal wound, said to herself, Am I to admit defeat, unable to keep these Trojans and their king from Italy? Forbidden by the fates, am I? Pallas could burn the Argive's fleet and drown all hands for one man's offense. Oily and Ajax's fit of passion. She herself hurled Jupiter's fire from heaven, splintered the ships, churned up the sea, and whirled up Ajax, exhaling flames from his pierced lungs, and impaled him on a crag. But I, who walk among the gods as their queen, sister of Jupiter and Jupiter's wife, I have to wage war for years on end against this one race. Who will worship Juno after this, or bow down before her holy altars? Her heart inflamed, the goddess went to Aeolia a country of clouds and raging winds. Here in a vast cave, Aeolus rules the squalls and gales, keeping them chained in vaulted cells. The indignant winds roar at their prison doors, rumbling deep in the mountain. But Aeolus sits on high, and with his scepter calms their frenzied souls. If he did not, they would swoop over land and sea and through the deep sky, sweeping everything before them. Fearing just this, the Father Almighty hid them away in dark caves and piled above them a mountain massive. And he gave them a king, one who would know, by chartered agreement, when to restrain and when to unleash them. It was to Aeolus that Juno came as a suppliant. Aeolus, by order of father of gods and men, you calm the ways or provoke them with wind. A race I despise sails the Tyrrhenian Sea, bringing Ilium's conquered gods to Italy. Hit them hard with a storm and sink their ships or scatter the fleet and litter the sea with corpses. I have fourteen nymphs with lovely bodies, the most radiant of which, Deopea, I will pronounce your wife, to have and to hold, in return for this favor. She will live with you all her years and bear you beautiful children. And Aeolus, it is yours to consider what you want, my queen, and mine to fulfill your commands. To you I owe this modest realm and Jove's good will. You grant me a seat at the table of the gods, and you make me master of cloud and storm. With that, he drove the butt of his spear against the cavernous mountainside, and the winds in battle formation rushed out of all ports and whirled over the earth. Swooping down, they fell on the sea. Eris and Notus churned up the depths, and with them Africus, whose dark squall line rolled huge waves shoreward. The crews began to shout, the rigging creaked, and then, in an instant, 
Clouds stole the daylight from the Trojans' eyes. Night lay black on the sea. The sky's roof thundered and flashed with lightning. And everywhere, men saw the presence of death. Aeneas's limbs suddenly went numb with cold. He groaned and lifted both palms to heaven and said, Three times, four times luckier were those who died before their parents' eyes under Troy's high walls. O oh, Diomedes, bravest of the Greeks, if only I had been killed by your right hand on Ilium's plain, where Hector went down under Achilles' spear, where huge Sarpedon lies, where the Samoas roils, so many shields and helmets caught in its current, and the bodies of so many brave heroes. As he was speaking, a howling from wind from the north struck against the sail. Waves shot to the stars, the oars shattered, the prow swung round, exposing the side to the waves, and then a mountain of water broke over the fleet. The crews of some ships bobbed high on the crest, while the wave's deep trough revealed to others the deep sea floor churning with sand. The south wind twirled a trio of ships onto the altars, the Italian's grim name for the hulk of reef lurking under the sea. The east wind pushed another three ships into the shallows and ground them onto the Surtees shoals, bedding them down in pockets of sand. Another ship, which carried the Lycians and trusted Orontes, sank before Aeneas' own eyes. A wall of water crashed onto the deck, and the pilot flew head first into the sea. The ship spun around twice, three times, caught in a whirlpool that sucked it down quickly. You could see men swimming here and there in the vast gulf. Wicker shields, plaques, and Trojan finery floated on the waves, and now Ilioneus' strong ship, now Achates, now the ships that carried Abbas and old Aletes were battered by the storm. Their joints sagged, and they took on water through their splitting seams. Meanwhile, the news filtered down to Neptune of the turmoil above. He heard the murmur from the churning surface, and he felt the still bottom water rise in upheaval. Lifting his serene face above the waves, he peered out and saw Aeneas's fleet scattered and the Trojans overwhelmed by the rough seas and the sky's downpour. His sister's treachery was all too obvious. Calling Eurus and Zephyrus, he said to them, do you have so much confidence winds in your family's connections? Do you dare overturn heaven and earth and raise tons of water up to the sky without my divine sanction? Why, I ought to. But settling the waves comes first. You won't get off so lightly next time. Now clear out of here and tell your king this. The sea and the trident were allotted to me, not to him. His domain is the outsized rock that you and yours, Eurus, call home. Aeolus can puff himself up there in his own hall and lord it over the prison of the winds. Thus Neptune, and no sooner said than done, he calmed the sea, chased off the massed clouds, and brought back the sun. Simothoe and Triton worked together, pushed the ships off the jagged reef. Neptune himself levered them up with his trident, cut channels through the shoals, and eased the swells, his chariot's wheels skimming the white caps. Riots will often break out in a crowded assembly when the rabble are roused. Torches and stones are soon flying. Fury always finds weapons. But then all eyes light upon a loyal citizen, a man of respect. The crowd stands still in hushed expectation, and with grave words he masters their tempers and calms their hearts. So too the crashing sea fell silent, as its sire, surveying the watery expanse, drove his chariot under a clear sky, giving the horses free rein. Aeneas's men, numb with fatigue, made for the nearest land, the coast of Libya. They found a deep bay across whose mouth an island stands and makes a good port. The waves that roll in from the open sea break on its sides and ripple on to shore. The bay is flanked by high cliffs. Twin crags rise like threats toward the sky, but the water below is sheltered and silent. Above, shimmering woods and rising higher, a dark grove with sinister shadows. Opposite the looming crags is a cave with sweet water springs and stone seats inside, a haunt of the nymphs. Sea-weary ships need not be tied in this harbor, nor moored by hooked anchors that bite the seafloor. 
Aeneas puts in here with the seven ships that are left of his fleet, lusting for dry land. The Trojans disembark on the welcome beach, laying their brine-soaked bodies on the sand. Achates strikes a flint and catches a spark in leaves, then feeds the flames with dry tinder. The men bring out whatever grain they can salvage from the spoiled stores and, weary of it all, pat, parch the kernels and grind grain on stones. Aeneas now climbed up to an isolated part with a view of the sea spread out below, hoping to see where the storm might have left the Phrygian galleys of Antheus or of Capus, or to glimpse Caicus's armor mounted high on the stern. There was no ship in sight, but he did see three stags browsing on the shore and behind them an entire herd feeding in a long line down through the valley. Aeneas stood still, as did faithful Achates, who passed over feathered arrows and bow. He brought down the leaders, each standing tall with a thicket of antlers, and then he shot at the herd itself, scattering them with his arrows into the woods. He did not stop shooting until he had triumphantly brought down seven good-sized animals, one for each ship. Back at the port, Aeneas divided the meat among all of his men and distributed wine that the hero Acestes had stored in jars and given to them at their departure for Sicily's shores, from Sicily's shores. And then Aeneas spoke to his men to ease their hearts. Trojans, this is not our first taste of trouble. You have suffered worse than this, my friends, and God will grant an end to this also. You face Scylla's fury and her thundering crags and brave the Cyclops' rocks. Recall your courage and put aside your fear and grief. Some day, perhaps, it will help to remember these troubles as well. Through all sorts of perils, through countless dangers, we are headed for Latium, where the fates promise us a peaceful home, and where Troy will rise again. Endure and save yourselves for happier times. And he said this, and though he was sick with worry, he put on a good face and pushed his anguish deep into his heart. They set about preparing a feast from the kill. Some did the skinning and butchering and skewered the still quivering flesh on spits. Others set cauldrons on the shore and tended the fires. The meal revived their strength. Spread out along the grass, they took their fill of old wine and fat venison. When the feast was finished, they talked along with their lost companions, hoping they were still alive, but fearing they had met their end and would hear no more when their names were called. Loyal Aeneas grieved especially for bold Orontes and lamented in silence the bitter loss of Amicus and Lycus and brave Gaius and brave Cloanthus. The day was at an end, and Jupiter was looking down from heaven's zenith at the sail-winged sea and at the shores of all the peopled lands spread far and wide, and as he looked he paused at the sky's pinnacle and turned his luminous eyes toward Libya, pondering the world's woes. And Venus, sad, her eyes shining with tears, said to him, Lord of lightning, eternal ruler of gods and men, what has my Aeneas done to offend you? What have my Trojans done? They have suffered one disaster after another, and still the whole world is barred to them to keep them out of Italy. Surely some day, in the turning of time, the Romans are to arise from this race. They will continue Teucer's bloodline and give birth to rulers who will hold earth and sea under their dominion. You promised. What has changed your mind, father? That promise was what consoled me at Troy's heart-rending downfall. I balanced one fate against another, but the fortunes of these men, after all their mishaps, have still not changed. What end, O oh Lord, will you grant to their toils? Antinor was able to escape the Greeks, cross safely over the Illyrian gulfs, past the Liburnians' inmost realms, and skirt the springs of Tim Avis, where it burst through nine roaring mouths and floods the fields under a sounding sea. There he 
founded the town of Padua, settled his Teucrians, named his race, and fixed the arms of Troy on a temple wall. Now he is at rest and enjoys peaceful ease. But we, your own flesh and blood, to whom you have opened the heights of heaven, have lost our ships. Oh, the infamy! And because of one deity's anger are betrayed and disbarred from the shores of Italy, is this the reward for devotion? Is this how you restore our ancestral power? Smiling at her with the look that calms storms and clears the sky, the father of gods and men kissed his daughter lightly and said, Spare your fears, Cytherian. Your people's destiny remains unmoved. You will see Lavinium and its promised walls, and you will raise great souled Aeneas to the stars on high. I have not changed my mind. Your son, I will speak at length, since you are so worried, unrolling fate's scroll and revealing its secrets. Your son will wage war in Italy, crush barbarous nations, and set up laws and city walls for his own people, reigning in Latium until three summers have passed and three winters since the Rutulians' defeat. But the boy Ascanius, surnamed Iolus, his name was Illus while Ilium still stood, will be in power for thirty great cycles of the rolling months, will move his throne from Lavinium and build the mighty walls of Alba Longa. The kingdom will endure for three hundred years under Hector's race, until Ilia, Vesta's royal priestess, pregnant by Mars, shall give birth to twins. Then Romulus, proud in the tawny hide of the wolf who nursed him, will continue the lineage, build the walls of Mars, and call the people after his own name, Romans. For these I set no limits in time or space, and have given to them eternal empire, world without end. Even Juno, who in her spite and fear now vexes earth, sea, and sky, shall adopt a better view, and with me cherish the Romans, lords of the world, the people of the toga. That is my pleasure, and there will come a time as the years glide on when the descendants of Trojan Asaracus shall subdue glorious Mycenae, Pythia, and Argos. From this resplendent line shall be born Trojan Caesar." who will extend his empire to the ocean and his glory to the stars, a Julian in the lineage of great Illus. And you, Venus, free at last from care, will some day welcome him into heaven, laden with oriental spoils of war, and his name, too, will be invoked in vows. Then war shall be no more, and the ages will grow mild. Gray-haired Faith and Vesta and Quirinus, with his brother Remus, will make laws. The gates of war, iron upon bolted iron, shall be closed, and inside impious fury will squat enthroned on the savage weapons of war, hands bound tight behind his back with a hundred brazen knots, howling horrible curses from his blood-filled mouth. Thus Jupiter, and from heaven he dispatched Mercury, Maya's winged son, so that Carthage with its newly built towers would lie open to welcome the Trojans, and that Dido, in her ignorance of fate, would not ban them from her land. The god's wings his way through the vast sky, quickly touches down on Libya's shore, and just as quickly accomplishes his mission. At the god's will, the Phoenicians put aside their fighting spirit, and above all, the queen conceived a great benevolence toward the Trojans. Aeneas, meanwhile, aware of his duty, was up thinking the whole night through. When dawn kissed his face with light, he resolved to set forth and explore the strange coastline to see which way the wind had blown him, and to see who lived there, man or beast, in the untilled land that lay before him. Then he would report back to his men. He hid the fleet under a rocky overhang, steeped in a forest's shimmering shade. Then he strode forth with Achates, his only companion, gripping in his hand a pair of javelins tipped with flared iron. And there, in the middle of the forest, was his mother, coming toward him. She looked and dressed like a young woman, and bore a huntress's weapons. She could have been a Spartan girl, or Carpalis of Thrace, who outruns horses and the Hebrus' rapids. A supple bow was slung over her shoulders in the style of a huntress, and she let her hair fly loose in the wind. Her flowing robe was cinched up in a knot, offering a glimpse of her knees. She spoke first. Have either of you seen any of my sisters? They're sporting quivers and lynx hides, 
they may have wandered here or are hot on the trail of a frothing boar. Thus Venus, and the son of Venus, responded. I've neither heard nor seen uh, any of your sisters, but how should I address you, maiden? Your face is hardly mortal, and your voice does not sound human. Surely you are a goddess, Apollo's sister, one of the nymphs. Whoever you are, goddess, be gracious to us, lighten our burden, and tell us, under what sky are we now? Into what part of the world have we been tossed? We are strangers in a strange land, lost, driven here by the wind and immense seas. Many victims will fall by my hand at your altars. And Venus, I am hardly worthy of such honor. It is customary among Tyrian girls to carry quivers and lace on high scarlet boots. What you see around you is Tyrian country and a Punic city from Agenor's bloodline, but it borders on Libya, a warlike nation. Dido rules here, having left her city Tyre to escape from her brother. It's a long story, full of intrigue, but I will sum it up for you. Dido's husband, Zacchaeus, was the richest man in Phoenicia, and loved dearly by ill-starred Dido. Her father, with good omens, had given her to him untouched and virgin, but her brother, Pygmalion, who ruled the land, was a most wicked man. A feud rose up between the two men, and impious Pygmalion, blind with gold lust and contemptuous of his sister's love, secretly cut down Zacchaeus before the altars, alone and off guard. The villain hid his crime for a long time, and with many pretenses cruelly kept alive for Dido's vain hopes. But the actual ghost of her unburied husband visited her dreams, lifting his pale face in wondrous ways. He showed her the blood-stained altars, bared his pierced chest, and revealed the crime at the dark heart of the noble house. Then he urged her to flee the country, and to aid her journey, he showed her where an ancient secret treasure was buried, untold tons of silver and gold. Roused by all this, Dido prepared for flight, joined by others who either feared or hated the cruel tyrant. They commandeered ships, loaded them with gold, and all the wealth of avaricious Pygmalion was shipped out to sea. A woman did this. They arrived at the place where now you see the soaring walls of a new city, Carthage. They bought as much land as they could surround with the hide of an ox, and so its name, Bursa. But who are you? From what shores did you sail, and where are you going? Faced with such questions, Aeneas sighed and drew his voice from deep within. Goddess, if I were to start from the beginning and tell you the whole tale of our suffering, dusk would gather over the dying day. We are from Troy. Perhaps the name of that ancient city means something to you. We have wandered the seas, and a storm has driven us to the coast of Libya. I am Aeneas, devoted to my city's gods, refugees I rescued from enemy lands, and my ship's most precious cargo. My fame has reached the heavens above. My quest is for Italy to be our fatherland, and to found a race descended from Jove Most High. I embarked on the Phrygian Sea with twenty ships, my mother charting my course as I pursued my destiny. Scarcely seven have survived the winds and the waves. Lost, destitute, I wander the Libyan desert, a man expelled from both Europe and Asia. Venus would not endure any further self-pity, and interrupted him in mid-complaint. Whoever you are, I can hardly believe you draw your breath cursed by the gods. After all, here you are at our Tyrian town. Just get yourself to the queen's doorstep. I foretell that your ships and comrades are safe, driven to the shore by winds from the north. Unless I've learned nothing about reading birds, observe the serenity of those twelve gliding swans. An eagle, Job's bird, swooped down from above and disturbed their flight in the open sky. But now they are flying in a long line again. Some have landed, and you can see the others looking down for a good place to alight, just as those birds in formation again sport with wings whirring, rimming the sky and issuing their song. So too your ships, with their hearty crews, are either in port or entering the harbor under full sail. Well, go on. Just let your feet follow the road. She spoke, and as she turned, her neck shone with rose light, an immortal fragrance from her ambrosial locks perfumed the air. Her robes flowed down to cover her feet, and every step revealed her divinity. Aeneas knew his own mother, and his voice fell away from her as she disappeared. You! Do you have to cheat your son with empty appearances? Why can't we at least embrace and talk to each other in our own true voices? With this rebuke, Aeneas turned toward the city. Venus, for her part, 
enclosed both her son and his companion in a dark cloud, cloaking them in mist so that none would see them as they walked along, and so detain them with questions about their reasons for coming. And then she was gone, aloft to Paphos, happy to see her temple again, where Arabian incense curls up from one hundred altars, and fresh wreaths of flowers sweeten the air. The two heroes, meanwhile, followed the path, and ascended a high hill above the city. Looking down, Aeneas was amazed at the sheer size of the place. Only a few hovels, the city gates, the bustle on the paved streets, the Tyrians were hard at work, building walls, fortifying the citadel, rolling boulders by hand, marking out sites for houses with trenches. As Aeneas watched, they made laws, chose officials, installed a senate. Some were dredging the harbor, others laying the foundation for a theater, carving huge columns out of a cliff to grace the stage that was yet to be built. Like bees under an early summer sun, leading a new swarm out to the wild flowers, or stuffing honey into the comb, swelling the cells with nectar, or unloading the pollen other bees bring to the stall, or warding off the worthless brood of drones, the busy hive settles seeds with all their activity, and the fragrant honey is redolent of time. Happy are they whose walls are rising. Thus Aeneas, as he surveyed the city's heights, and then, hidden in the miraculous cloud, he mingled with the citizens, invisible to all. At the city's center there was a shady grove. It was here the Phoenicians, when they made land, refugees from the surge and storms of the sea, had dug up the token foretold by Juno, the head of a spirited horse, an augury of success in war and a prosperous people. Here, Sidonian Dido had dedicated a huge temple to Juno, rich with offerings and the goddess's presence. A bronze threshold surmounted the steps. The joints and beams glowed with bronze, and bronze doors slowly groaned open on heavy hinges. It was in this grove that Aeneas could finally relax. Here he first dared to hope for safe harbor and have confidence after all his trials in a turn for the better. For while he was waiting for the queen, touring the temple, marveling at the city's great good fortune and at the work of various artisans blended together, he saw pictured on the walls the whole Trojan War, whose fame had already spread through the world. There were the sons of Atreus, there Priam, and there Achilles, raging at each of them. Aeneas stopped and said with tears in his eyes, Is there any place on earth, Achates, not filled with our sorrows? Look, there is Priam. Here, too, honor matters. Here are the tears of the ages, and minds touched by human suffering. Breathe easy, my friend. Troy's renown will yet be your salvation. And he fed thus Aeneas, and he fed his soul on empty pictures, sighing, weeping, his face a flood of tears, as he scanned the mural of the war. On one panel, the Greeks are in full retreat, with the Trojan youth hard on their heels. In the other direction, crested Achilles bears down on the Trojans with his chariot. A little farther on, he sees through his tears the snowy canvas of Rhesus's tents. His camp, betrayed in their first night at Troy, and savaged by the blood-soaked son of Tydeus, who then drove the fiery steeds of Rhesus to the Trojan camp, before they ever tasted Trojan fodder or drank from the Xanthus. On another panel, Troilus, just a boy and no match for Achilles in combat, has lost his armor and is being dragged by his stampeding horses, falling backward from his empty chariot. He still holds the reins while his neck and hair trail in the dust, and the plain is scored by the tip of his spear. Meanwhile, Trojan women, their hair streaming, are going to the temple of implacable Pallas, bearing a robe and beating their breasts in supplication. The goddess's head is turned away, and she keeps her eyes fixed on the ground. And now Achilles has dragged Hector three times round the walls of Troy, and is selling the lifeless body for gold. Aeneas is choked with grief when he sees the spoils, the chariot, the corpse of his friend, and Priam stretching out weaponless hands. And now Aeneas recognizes himself in close combat with the foremost Achaeans and sees the eastern ranks, dark Memnon's armor, and Penthesilia among her thousands of Amazons with their crescent shields. Burning with fury, she binds a golden belt below one naked breast, 
a warrior queen daring to do battle with men. While Aeneas's gaze was fixed on these marvels, the queen was making her way to the temple, the most beautiful Dido, and as she walked, a throng of youths crowded round her. On the Erotus's banks on the ridges of Synthus, Diana leads the dances, and a thousand oreads circle round her this way and that. A quiver hangs from her shoulder, and as she treads the towers above the other goddesses, and Latona's heart beats with secret joy. So too Dido moved through their midst, urged on the work of building a kingdom, then under the temple's vaulted entrance, and flanked by guards, she ascended her throne. She was making laws for her people, distributing duties or assigning them by lot. When suddenly Aeneas saw, coming toward him in a crowd, Antheus, Sergestus, and brave Cloanthus, along with other Trojans, whom the black storm had scattered and driven to distant shores. Aeneas was stunned, Achates too, with joy and fear. They burned with desire to clasp hands with them, but were confused and uncertain of the situation. They kept themselves hidden inside the cloud and watched. What has happened to their comrades? On what shore did they leave their ships? Why have they come here? These are chosen men from all the ships, making for the temple with loud cries and prayers for indulgence. When they had entered and were allowed to speak, the eldest, Ilioneus, calmly began, Queen, whom Jupiter has permitted to found a new city and to curb with justice the arrogance of the surrounding tribes, we are Trojans, blown by winds over the sea. In our misery, we pray you to prohibit the burning of our ships, spare a pious race, and look with grace upon our fortunes. We have not come to pillage your homes and carry the booty down to the shore. There is no such violence in our hearts, and no such arrogance in a conquered race. There is a place the Greeks call Hesperia, an ancient lord strong in war and rich in soil. Onotrians once lived there. Now it is said a younger race has named it Italy, after their leader. We were on course for that land. When a sudden squall rose up, Orion behind it, and drove us on to blind shoals, scattering our ships amid trackless rocks and overwhelming waves. We few drifted along and came to your shores. But what race of men is this? What land is so barbarous that it allows this conduct? We are denied access to the very shore. These warmongers forbid us to set foot on the border of their land. You may scorn our common humanity and mortal arms, but the gods will remember good and evil." We had a king, Aeneas, no one more just or devoted, no one greater in battle. If fate still preserves him, if he still breathes, the sky's pure air and does not yet lie with the shades, we have no fear, nor would you regret being first to contend with him in courtesy. There are cities in Sicily, too, and arms, and a hero of Trojan blood, Acestes, allow us to beach our storm-battered fleet, to mill planks and trim oars from your woods, so that if we find our comrades and leader and we are destined to go to Italy, to Italy and to Latium, we may gladly set forth. But if all is lost, and you, noble father of the Trojan people, have gone down in the Libyan Sea, and Aeolus is our hope no more, then at least we can seek the Straits of Sicily, whence we came here, and our homes there, with Acestes as our king. Thus Ilioneus, and all the Trojans murmured in approval. Dido, eyes lowered, responded briefly, Fear no more, Teucrians, ease your hearts. Stern necessity and my kingdom's newness force me to such measures to protect our frontier. Who does not know of Aeneas of Troy, of that city's warriors and its exploits, of the conflagrations of that great war? Punic, Carthage, hearts are not so dull and unfeeling, nor is Tyre so far from the course of the sun. Whether you choose great Hesperia, land of Saturn, or Sicily, the realm of Acestes, I will speed you safely on your journey. Or would you like to settle here, share my kingdom? The city I am founding is yours. Draw up your ships, Trojan and Tyrian, and I will treat the same. I only wish that Aeneas himself were here, driven in by the same south wind. Be sure I will dispatch our best men to scour the coast and search every corner of Libya. He may have been cast ashore, and may be wandering now in some wood or town. Aeneas and Achates, alert to every word, had long been burning to burst from the cloud, and now Achates turned to Aeneas and said, 
What do you think, God is born? You see that all is safe, our ship and men restored. Only one is missing, and he went down in the gulf before our own eyes. Everything else agrees with your mother's words. He had scarcely finished when the enveloping cloud parted and dissolved into thin air. There stood Aeneas, gleaming in the clear light, his face and shoulders like a god's. His mother breathed upon him the radiance of youth, breathed glory on his hair, and she gave his eyes an excellent and exultant luster, like the sheen of hand-rubbed ivory, or parian marble, or silver set in gold. Unforeseen, unexpected, he addressed the queen. The man you seek is before you. I am Aeneas of Troy, saved from Libyan seas. Dido, you alone have pitied Ilium's unutterable woes, and now you offer us. The remnant left by the Greeks, outworn by every misfortune on land and sea, a destitute band. You offer us a share of your city and your home. We do not have the means to render worthy thanks, nor do any Trojan survivors anywhere in the wide world. May the gods, if any powers above, look down on the pious, if there is any justice anywhere. May the gods and your good conscience reward you as you deserve. What happy age bore you? What noble parents gave birth to such a child? While rivers run to the sea, while shadows move over mountainsides, while the sky pastures the stars, ever shall your honor, your name, and your praises endure, whatever the lands that summon me. Aeneas spoke, and he reached out for dear Ilioneus with his right hand, Serestus with his left, and then the others, his brave Gaius and brave Cloanthus. Dido, stunned by his sudden appearance and his great ill fortune, responded, Goddess born, what misfortune has plagued you? What force has driven you onto savage coasts? You then are Aeneas, whom Venus bore to Anchises, near the waters of the Simois River in Troy? I remember well when Teucer came to Sidon, exiled by his father and seeking new realms with the aid of Belus, my own father, who was waging war in Cyprus then, establishing his power on that rich land. Since that time I have known about Troy, known you by name, and the Pelasgian leaders, the Trojans' enemies, sang Troy's praises and wanted it known that he was of Tro Trojan stock. And so young men come under my roof, my fortune, too, has long been adverse, but at last has allowed me to rest in this land. My own acquaintance with suffering has taught me to aid others in need. Thus Dido, and as she led Aeneas into her palace, she proclaimed sacrifices in his honor in all the temples. Meanwhile, she sent to his comrades on the shore twenty bulls, a hundred boars with great bristling backs, and as many fat lambs with their dams, the day's joyful gifts. The palace gleamed with luxurious furnishings as the great hall was being prepared for a banquet. Coverlets embroidered with royal purple, heavy silver on the tables, gold cups engraved with the heroic deeds of a long lineage, stretching back to the origin of the race. But Aeneas' love for his son, Ascanius, would not allow his mind to rest. He sent Agates on the run to the ships to report the news and to bring the boy back to the city. Ascanius was all Aeneas's care. He also told Achates to bring presents snatched from ruined Ilium, a mantle stiff with gold-stitched figures and a veil fringed with saffron, acanthus, both worn by Helen, who brought them from Mycenae, wondrous gifts from her mother, Leda, when she sailed for Troy and her illicit wedding, the scepter, too, of Priam's eldest daughter, Ilione, and a pearl necklace and a coronet with a double band of jewel, jewels and gold, and so Achates hurried off to the ships. Venus, meanwhile, was busily concocting another scheme. She would send Cupid, transformed to look just like Ascanius, to come in the pal, the place of that sweet boy, and with his gifts inflame the queen's heart and infiltrate her bones with fire. The Cytherian feared this dubious union, Tyrion speaking two tongues. She chafed under Juno's arrogance, and at nightfall her anxiety mounted. She turned, therefore, to the winged god of love and spoke to him. My son, my strength and my power, you alone scorn your father's Typhoian lightning blast, and so to your godhead I come on bended knee. You know how your brother Aeneas is beaten about the sea by Juno's wrath, and you have often grieved at my grief for him. Phoenician Dido now has him and detains him with soft words. 
I dread the outcome of Juno's hospitality. She will not be idle during this great turn of events, and so I plan to catch the queen off guard and by guile encircle her with passion so that no power can change her, and she will be bound to me by her great love for my Aeneas. Now, here is how I think you can do this. The young prince, my pride and joy and all my care, is preparing to go at his father's summons to the Sidonian city, bearing such gifts as have survived the sea in the flames of Troy. I will wrap him in slumber and tuck him away in my sacred shrine, either high on Scythera or on Idalium, so that he will never know of my trickery or get in the way. For a single night, no more. Feign his looks, boy that you are. Wear the boy's familiar face. And when amid the royal feast and flowing wine, Dido, her joy knowing no bounds, takes you onto her lap, embraces you, and plants sweet kisses on your mouth, breathe into her your secret fire, and poison her unobserved. Love obeyed his dear mother, donned his wings, and walked off joyously with Aeolus's gate. Aeolus himself, Venus, bathed in the waters of calm repose, and holding him to her breast, lifted him up to Adelia's high groves, where soft marjoram breathed upon him, nestled in blossoms sweet in the shade. And so Cupid, obedient to his mother's word and delighting in the company of Achates, carried the royal gifts to the palace. When he arrived, the queen had already taken her place amid gorgeous tapestries, reclining on a golden couch in the great hall. Father Aeneas and the Trojan youth gathered and were made to recline on purple coverlets. Servants poured water on their hands, served bread from baskets, and brought them soft napkins. There were fifty maids working in the kitchen to repair all the banquet's dishes in order and to keep the hearth fire for the penance. Another hundred, and as many male servants, all the same age, laid the food on the table and set out the cups. The Tyrians, too, crowded the festive hall and were told to recline on embroidered couches. They marveled at Aeneas's gifts, and they marveled at Aeolus, at the god's glowing complexion, at the words he feigned, and at the robe and the veil elaborately stitched with saffron asanthus. Dido especially, doomed to a wretched end, could not satisfy her soul. The ill-fated Phoenician burned with desire when she gazed at the boy and was equally moved at the sight of the gifts. The boy, when he had hung on Aeneas's neck and satisfied the deluded father's love, went to the queen, and she clung to him with all her heart. Her eyes were riveted on him, and she cuddled him on her lap. Poor Dido, she had no idea how great a god had settled there. Mindful of his Acidalian mother, little by little he began to blot out Zacchaeus and tried to captivate with a living passion her slumbering soul and her heart long unused. At the first lull in the feast, the tables were cleared. Great bowls were set out and crowned with wine. The palace grew loud and the guests' voices echoed through the halls. Glowing lamps hung down from the fretted gold ceiling and flaming torches vanquished the night. Dido called for a heavy gold drinking bowl, crusted with jewels, and filled it with wine, a bowl used by Billis and Billis's descendants. Then silence reigned in the great hall again. Jupiter, lord of hospitality, grant that this day be a happy one for Tyrians and Trojan travelers alike, and may our children remember it. May Bacchus, giver of joy, be near. May Juno bless us, and may all Tyrian gods, Tyrians, favor our gathering with grace and good cheer. Dido prayed and then poured a drop onto the table. After this libation, her lips were the first to touch the bowl's rim. Then she passed it to Britius with a challenge, and he promptly drained the foaming bowl, soaking himself in the brimming gold. Then the other lords drank. Long-haired Eopas, a bard taught by mighty Atlas, now sounded his golden lyre. He sang of the wandering moon and the sun's toils, of the origin of human and animal kind, of how rain falls and why lightning flashes of Arcturus, the bears, and the misty Hyades, of why the winter sun rushes down to ocean, and why long winter nights are so slow to end. The Tyrians applauded again and again, and the Trojans joined in, and Dido, unhappy woman, prolonged the night with various varied conversation, and drank deeply the long drought of love. She asked about Priam over and over, asked much about Hector, wanted to know what armor Memnon wore when he arrived, what the horses of Diomedes were like, and how great was Achilles. Still better, she cries, tell us, my dear guest, the whole story from the beginning, the treachery of the Greeks, 
the Greeks, the downfall of your people and your own wanderings, seven summers have now seen you roving through every land and over all the seas.